Putty? I yeah. don't know what Putty's default escape is. Um, it doesn't say it's using Telnet when I opened that. No, it's, it's using the Telnet protocol. It's trying to talk to port 23. Okay. Um, but try using a raw connection instead. Because okay. that does no interpretation. It just should send whatever you type directly. Whatever comes in should get displayed. Okay. But grab me in my office if that doesn't work. And there should be a way to escape out of it. But yeah, that was what I was thinking. It yeah. works fine. Like it'll, it'll detect if I uh, just exit out of Putty. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like it's not detecting. Oh, okay. It's closing. I just can't close it. Yeah, yeah. Did you try Control D? Yeah, that didn't work either. Yeah. In the Control Z that people say works on Eclipse. Yeah, if you do that in Linux, it does something different though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But yeah, Telnet, the program Telnet is nothing magic, right? It's yeah. basically doing what you're doing in PA5. It mm -hmm. opens a connection to a port on an address and does a two-way exchange. And it just traps a control right bracket to let you come back into the command line and send commands and stuff. I think it interprets it as literally the escape character. Because <laughs> when I do the control right bracket, it does it shows like the carrot right back. Right? Yeah. Which was interesting. Yeah. Cool. So, other questions, comments? Is the lab due Friday? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How's that coming? Did you find someone to test yours with? PA5 questions? I'm moving this weekend, so I'm probably not going to be online. So today or tomorrow is your probably last chance to hit me with questions. All right, cool. Well, let's go on. Um, so I want to talk about some C++ today. And C++ is basically an object-oriented version of C. And Java kind of looks a lot like C, so you could almost think that Java is kind of like an object-oriented version of C, right? Um, but C++ is, is much older. Um, it's been around for decades. And I never quite developed a taste for C++ myself because there were some things that it did that didn't feel totally consistent to me. And that's okay, right? Consistency is, is um, there's some quote about it being the hobgoblin of little minds, I think, but maybe that's something else. But, um, but I like consistency in, in experiences like programming languages, but C++ does some things differently, probably for good reasons. So um, my goal here is just to kind of give you a, an idea of a different object-oriented language, right? And show you some of the things that are unique to C++ versus C. Um, they simplify a lot of the input-output mechanisms so we can live without printf and fgets and scanf and things like that. Um, but then they put objects on top of it also. Um, and one of the things you get with C++ that you don't get directly with Java is um, operator overloading. So we can actually define a function and call it plus or minus or times. Um, you know, the actual symbol, and use that to operate on objects of our chosen type and have it run code that we specify. Um, so let's, let's just start with the basics. So you can use a .c extension for C++. Um, so there still include files, but we include IO stream instead of standard IO.h. Okay, um, there's no dot H's on these. Um, main method can just be declared as main as usual. We can still do printf's, right? So we can printf, haha. Uh -huh. But the more sort of usual way to do this is to use this thing called standard colon colon cout, 
and C out is basically a reference to standard out. And then we use this redirection symbol like we do in Unix that effectively we can interpret as take this string and send it to C out, standard out. Right, so we've got hello, this is cool, and a new line terminator at the end, and we're sending that into this output stream. And let me open up a second tab. So we compile, compile with C++ instead of just CC or GCC. Um, and when we run this, it does what you'd hope it does. Generates your output. So std colon colon c out is kind of a pain, so we can define a namespace. So we're saying using the namespace std, and this is kind of like an import statement in the sense that if we just say c out and it doesn't know what c out is, it will say, hey, is it std c out, right? And it is, so it'll understand this statement perfectly well. So that also works. And we can get rid of the backslash n and use this symbol endline, endl. And that means backslash n, but it's a little less cryptic looking, perhaps. Um, and we can also put multiple things that we want to send to C out. So this is read from left to right. So this will put out the word cool and the word haha -ha and then the end line. Right, it's not a big surprise. And if we do that, we'll get these things on separate lines. that I didn't really need. So the output's a little, a little less uh, cryptic looking than the usual printf with the escaped new line characters and so on and so forth. So C++ has strings as a built-in type. We can include angle bracket string, and now we can define variables to be strings, like x and y in this case. And we're setting x equal to hello, we set y equal to x, and we set x equal to by, and then we can send x and y to standard out and see what their values are. And if we interpret this the way that we imagine, x is the string hello, here y is the string hello, and then x should be the string by, so this should output by followed by hello. And that's what it does. So on the input side, we can input by redirecting C in. So that's basically saying take standard in and copy it to X, where in this case X is an integer. So this will do F gets and S scan F for us, basically. So X and Y are integers. We're going to print out the message enter X. We're going to read standard in, copy that to X, print out the message enter Y, read that into Y, and then we'll print out the values on this big long C out statement. So enter X 23, enter Y 56, X is 23, Y is 56. Not a big surprise.
so here again well let's let's do this first so if I set x to 42 and I said y to ha ha it tells me x is 42 and y is 0 but the thing I did a moment before that enter x and I say ha ha it says enter y it doesn't wait for me to enter y it sets x equal to 0 and it sets y to 37 6 32765 Although when I did this before, it said y to 32,764. And here it said it to 32,767. So what's going on with this code? Maybe. I don't actually know if it is or isn't. Why is it not letting me enter y? You've probably seen this before in C. This behavior. Oh, it's kind of like scanf, where if it doesn't get exactly what it's expecting, it'll just click. Basically. So so, yeah. I mean, that's that's certainly the effect. So here's standard in. Right, and think of it as a pipe. So we've typed in ha ha, we've hit enter. So the beginning of this pipe has the letter H followed by an A, an H, an A, and a new line. And when we get to this instruction, it says read from standard in, copy that to X. What does it find in the beginning of standard in? It finds an H. And it says X is an integer, this character is an H, I can't turn that into an integer. Forget it, I'm gonna give up, I'm just gonna set X equal to zero. Right? And then it comes down here where it says copy C in to Y, and there's an H in the beginning of standard in, and it says I can't convert that to an integer. And so it's just going to store nothing in Y, and then program exits. So the problem is, since we can't convert what's in standard in to an integer, it doesn't get consumed, right? It's not that it looks at the entire line up to the new line, pulls that in from standard in, empties out the buffer, and then tries to convert it. It's trying to convert it from standard in. So this is the issue when you use scanf instead of fgets and sscanf. Right? If you scanf directly from standard in and you're expecting an integer and it's not an integer, the stuff that's sitting in that buffer still sits in that buffer. And if you're only trying to ingest integers, none of those scanfs are going to make any progress on the buffer. So where is this weird value for y coming from? Let's give x and y some initial values. So x is being zeroed out, and y is not being changed. That doesn't quite make sense to me. I mean, if y is not being changed, that could make sense to causing a thing before. That's just what it was. It's not changing. Well, yeah, but why is x being changed? Yeah. That's the part that, that seems less consistent to me. If the type doesn't match, does that always default to zero? Or does it sometimes default to a random number as if you're looking at a weird point in memory? Well, the type didn't match for y. Yeah, or right. Well, does it make it hex? And then you can't find anything else that's zero? That's possible. Well, the other thing, too, is it's completely skipping your y input. That's why y is not getting changed. Well, that's possible. Maybe it's just not testing for y. But it's still doing the C out. So let's try this. Yeah. 
Let's see. Let's try that after we try to get y. Let's go ahead and enter a string. And I'm guessing that string is going to be equal to ha ha. And it's not going to actually wait for me to to type it. Or not. It stays empty. It stays empty. So it, it never actually gets past uh, the x input when it comes to putting input in. It's always. Mm -hmm. Although, you could try swap there on the entering y and then attempt. And then see if it's really being eaten up that from yeah. that. Could do that too. So the behavior seems to be that the first time you try to input an integer and it's not a valid integer, it stores a zero. I guess it could but be subsequent like inputs seem to be ignored. Yeah, it could just be like you say for future, it's like you always don't know how to use standard out, so I'm like, okay, you So I don't I don't have an explanation for that, but um scan it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's also a good question. Oh. All right. So, so it is doing the scanning we expect. All right, so. Yeah, and and when I say that, I'm sure that to somebody who who understands this is perfectly consistent, right? It's it's my own lack of experience showing itself, rather than probably some inherent flaw in the language, um, but but for me, that's how it comes across. So here's a weird little expression: x equals parentheses y equals twelve comma z equals three comma y plus one. What do you imagine this is gonna do? I think if, we, if I was going to bet on, I think it would set it to y plus one because uh, I think it would set it to true, true, and then y plus one. Well, set. it's it's not actually comparing; it's setting. Like it, it's actually yeah, it's a single equals, equals so assigning. Yeah. If you were going to get the true, that would be a double equal. <coughs> yeah, but isn't that a thing in, in C when you do an operation, it returns how successful it was, um, and then the only thing that looks like an actual assignment is y plus one. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that this does this in order. Like first it assigns it as y plus b equals twelve, and then last it assigns it as y plus one. So assigns what to y plus one? X to y plus one. Okay, so, so y will be twelve, z will be three, x will be thirteen. Yes. That's exactly what it does. So it will execute all the statements in the parentheses, right? Those are assignment statements, so they'll apply, and then the last expression becomes sort of the value of the thing in parentheses, right? And so x is set equal to, in this case, y plus 1. So yes, that's exactly what it does. It's like when the compilers are reading a bunch of lines. Kind of, yeah. Right, so if we just said x equals parentheses y equals 12, then x and y would both be 12. Oh, really? Okay. I believe. That's not, that's not, that's time. Test time. Well, because I thought you said that was the thing of the problem at one point, because when you assign something as something equals something, it just returns true, because it just assigned it successfully. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so yeah. All right, so the last thing that was evaluated was z equals 3. last thing that was done was z equals 3, and that is the value of 3. So it's 
So a liquid open CN has like a flag type system. Oh, okay. If it reads something and it can't like, what we would try to do, we would set a flag so and then the, it has a command where you can clear the flag. Okay. And it's just CN that clear. Cool. Okay, well that's handy. So here's the big question. So does C++ future. give you more information than a seg fault if you try to access Z when it doesn't have a value? Um, what does it do in that? It won't seg well, fault if I try to access Z. It'll give me whatever values there. Right, yeah. But I did get about 200 errors when I was compiling on one of these test programs. It was like an eight-line program. I got 200 errors, 200 lines of error output from the compiler. <laughs> it was very impressive to me. And it was like I missed a semicolon or something. Oh, that'll do it. Yeah. Um, all right. So, and, and this is kind of like when we do something like this. Right, why does that work? I've always thought of this as setting z equal to seven and then the value of this expression is seven, so y gets set to seven. And the value of that is seven. Right, which is which is kind of what we're seeing here. Yeah. just throw a seg fault if you try to access something you're not supposed to, or does it? Like a bad actually, memory location? Kind of like, uh, yeah, basically. I've never tried that. Um. Like if you try to access the, um, oh yeah, I guess that works. Segmentation fault. Yay. Yay. I'm using Java. <laughs> now this is good. We we like seg faults. So it's not a you know, like file or anything. It's just um, you compile know, and you just use machine code. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so C is like C in the sense it's a compiled language. Right? It it brings you down to um, to an executable. So there's the assembly language that it converts into. And this is x86 assembly. There's a great function name to call, right? <laughs> so that's a lot of code. Yeah. So one of the advantages to C was that it was faster than Java, right? Mm -hmm. Is C++ faster too? It should be. I mean, Java efficiency has gotten really good. Mm -hmm. And there's things you can do like just-in-time compilation where stuff is actually converted to machine code on the fly. But apples to <laughs> apples, right, Java is interpreted. So you've got your interpreter, your JVM, executing a bunch of machine code to do that, and what that's doing is reading your bytecode from your class file and deciding what to do, so it's, it's a layer of indirection. It's going to be a performance hit compared to something that compiles directly into machine code. Um, and that's one reason C++ is still popular. Um, there's some gaming engines that use C++, because um, that's where you're really concerned about speed. So back to strings, here x and y are strings. 
We set x equal to hello. And then we're going to read from standard n into the string y. We're going to echo the value of y. And then we're going to say if x equals y, print good. So it'll compare our input string to the string hello and tell us if they're the same. Which functions? Printf? Yeah, printf still works. Cool. Because okay. it's still just C, right? Okay. So as long as you have access to the runtime routines, you can call functions that you've written in C from C++. It's still just binary. Um, but will it make sense? Right, depends on context. Um, So we can run this, and if we enter ha ha, it tells us y is equal to ha ha, and it doesn't print good because ha ha is not equal to hello. If we run this and we say hello, it prints out the string hello, and it tells us this is good. Y does equal x. You're comparing strings, You're comparing strings which is kind of cool, except that we just spent all our time in Java kind of bumping into this fact that in Java, x would not be equal to y because they're different objects. The things that those objects represent are strings of characters, and the characters are the same. But if we want to test that in Java, we have to use a dot equals. If we want to test it in C, we have to use string compare, right, or somehow compare character by character. But in C++, equals equals is actually calling string compare or something functionally equivalent so it tells us if the strings are the same so that's convenient right not necessarily consistent but that's why we do things well it's not consistent with java yeah or c well i mean string is technically a data type in, well, it is a data type in C++. Right. And if you want to compare two data types in C, then you just put uh, two equal signs in between them. So having a data type string and allowing right. to put two right. different strings across from each other over two equal signs, right. that is consistent. True, true. Right. So the so difference is that string is an actual data type in C++, whereas in C, it's a car pointer. Right. So yeah, so it is, it is consistent. All right, we can also do multiple assignments on one line, so standard in can go into x and y, um, and that will read two values into two variables. So no, will that read standard in uh, into x and then standard in into y, or will that read standard in x and x into y? It and should read... Would, would x and y be the same? Or? I think the greater greater will say we're redirecting, just like with with... With standard out, right, we're not setting y equal to end line, okay. right? We're, we're, it's a notation, right, which says all of these things get sent to C out. Okay, so that, that works like we'd hope. And you can input on different lines, and that works fine. So it's functionally like having two CN into X, CN into Y statements in our usual non-laughing matter. Yeah, that's negative 1. I don't know why it's defaulting to that. That's the default value for Y, apparently. Way too much fun over there. But here's something different. So we're defining buffer to be a string, and we're doing something like constructing it here, right? Passing a string as an argument. We'll send it to standard out, and then we'll read standard in into buffer. 
And then we're running this, this function called string stream. So string stream buffer greater than greater than i. And what this is effectively doing is it's like when we say c in greater than greater than i. But instead of reading from standard in, we're reading from a virtual input stream that's created by taking the characters of buffer and pretending that that's what's coming into our stream. So it lets us use the same redirection mechanism, but the characters are coming from the contents of the string buffer. So this is functionally like an scanf, right? It lets us have a string buffer in this case and then turn it into an integer if it's valid. So if we type an integer, right, i is equal to 234. And if we type something that's not an integer, it doesn't convert, right? It stores a zero. So this would let us do input, save our input into strings, and then do this behavior of turning it into a different data type. So we can do iteration on things other than just integers. So we have this in most other languages. Um, so let me get rid of this. We're going to declare buffer to be a string. We're going to read it from standard in, and then we're going to use this this for statement for parentheses character c colon buffer. Okay, and this is kind of like for each in a shell language. Um, C is a character, it's going to be assigned in succession each character from our string one at a time and it will assign it to the first character, execute the body of the loop, assign it to the second character, execute the body of the loop and so on. All right, so basically a for each. So this should read our, our input string and then print it out one character per line. Except when we were inputting into integers, if we put spaces between them, it read the first one into the first integer, second into the second. Yeah, so it's breaking on the space. So it's basically like uh, Basically, yeah. And it's it's effectively like what scanf will do. If you scanf with a percent s, it will read up to the first white space, and it'll stop there. I don't know if we can trick it with codes. Yeah, I'm sure there is. It's odd to close something. I guess it's reading them all, the ASCII characters. Yeah. All right, so let's look at classes. So the usual boilerplate stuff at the top. Um, so we're defining a class named a circle, right? Keyword class, circle, curly bracket, 
and then body of the class definition, which goes down to here. All right, public, private, available. So we're saying the following things are public, radius, which is a double, x, y, which are doubles. All right, so we're defining a circle as a center point and a radius. And then we're defining some methods. So set rad is a void method. It takes a double argument, sets the radius equal to that argument. Um, set location takes double locations, x and y, and sets x and y equal to those. Double area returns the area of the circle, and distance returns um, the distance from the origin to the center. So how does uh, C++ treat local versus the global variables? If you had a local variable, like if you said double R instead of double radius, how would it respond to that? Would it let you have the double R inside of set rad and have double R? I don't know if there's a way to... I don't know if this exists. Does it? Well, well, we'll just see if it compiles. I gotta use an arrow. So, so very familiar, right? Um, this, this could effectively be Java, except for the arrow pointer um, and the public colon. But um, right, classes, objects, methods, variables, kind of the same story we've been doing. So how do we use this in our main code? Well, we construct a circle by saying circle C that declares C to be a circle. Um, but we don't have to call a separate constructor, right? When we say circle C, C is a circle now. And we can set its radius, we can set its location, and then we can run its methods and print out the area, the distance, and the radius, and so on. It's a what? Oh yeah, this is totally object oriented. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the real goal. So so just in like a history standpoint, which came first, Java or C C plus plus. I don't know when it came out, but I'm going to guess 80s, but I'm not up on the history. I mean, like, this is, I understand object oriented when it's very difficult for them to get for a while. I wonder if having it compiled remotely would be easier than having it compiled. I actually think that if I were writing a system, it would be easier to write um, an <coughs> interpreter for an object oriented language. Okay. I'm not sure why I think that. Um, yeah. Like they, it's possible that the interpreted idea wasn't even thought of until much later. Well, early languages were interpreted. Right? Basic was a really old language from Dartmouth, and that was interpreted. Um, Fortran, COBOL, those were compiled. PL1 compiled. So yeah, compilers are more common. Again, largely because of the speed issue. Um, APL was interpreted, but APL was a teaching language, and I think BASIC was probably largely a teaching language, though I don't know that for sure. Um, but FORTRAN was intended for scientific processing, right, formula translation. Um, and so that was all about speed. All right. 
same idea here, but we've got a constructor, right? So we have a method called circle, no return type specified, takes a set of arguments, and in this case, we just call the set radius and set location, but we could do anything we wanted in there, right? So this looks exactly like a constructor in Java, and we use it the same way, except again, we don't have to use the new keyword. We can just say circle C, parentheses, arguments, and it will go ahead and call that constructor. All right, so that works the same. work. Can I have two things with the same name, different signatures? So this is a totally different language, right? But you could already be pretty efficient programming in C++, right? There's going to be little syntactic differences. There's going to be a few nuances. But as far as working with classes and objects and constructors, right, it's, it's the same thing you've been doing for nine weeks at least. And it's C, right? So you know C already, which again, you know, is kind of what Java looks like too. Um, so as you go through more education and experience with programming languages, computer science, right? The set of new things that you have to learn kind of gets smaller in some way. Um, well, in the sense that that a lot of the new things you have to learn aren't really quite as new anymore, right? The leap from C to Java might have been like this. The leap from Java to C++ might be like this, right? Now, it doesn't mean that you can't spend your life learning all the details of a language or an operating system or an environment, um, but to get yourself on the air where you can start writing code and, and taking your intents and turning it into um, instructions for the computer, right? That step gets kind of smaller and smaller over time. Um, so one of my classes on programming languages, we came in and the first week he said, learn PL1, no, learn Pascal for next week, right? And it was a horrifying thought, but it ended up being not a big deal for anybody in the class because it was just different syntax, um, but it was a procedural language just like the ones we've been using. Um, and this is true for languages, it's true for operating systems, it's true for development environments, right? And it's true for whatever it is that, that you gain experience with. So here's our class definition of circle, right? And it's the same stuff. Um, the class definition actually ends right here, right? So it's all on this page. And there's no definition for the area function, right? There's a prototype for it up in the beginning of this class. I said double area paren paren with the famous semicolon after that instead of a curly bracket, which means we're prototyping a function, um, but there's no body of the function area in here. But what I can do is down here, outside of the class definition, I can define that function, and I define it as circle colon colon area, and it means this is a function called area, and it's part of the circle class. When would that be something you want to do? 
I have no idea. <laughs> um, except in terms of, of maybe having a class um, and extending it maybe. I don't know if you can do this across files. I'm thinking if you, if you had a bunch of very similar objects and there's only the one thing different, then you could say, okay, I'm gonna call the area function every time, but this time I want you to do this. Mm -hmm. And then next time I want you to do this. Right, right, that could be. In that case though, if you were to say that I want the area function of a circle, the class circle to be this, if you were to come across something else in your code that may have the same kind of syntax there where it's also trying to declare mm -hmm. this area and that's different, would that try to overwrite it or would it just get ignored or what would happen? Interesting. I don't know. It's a good experiment. So uh, the semicolons are what kind of tells it is it doing that? Or is it just that to be making curly back? So, so the prototyping is, is indicated by the semicolon, right? Same as in regular C. No, I'm sorry. Not but the semicolon. When we use it, the colon, colon? colon? Yes, the yeah. colons. Right, because if we just call it double area, it's just a function called area. It's got nothing to do with the class. Curious if we split this into two files, if it will somehow find. I don't know. I think I'll have to try that. That would seem really clever to me. Maybe if you wanted to make a generic class or something, and you just have like another quick function. Yeah, we can do generics also with or templates. No, I Okay, okay, so you can split it into files. Yeah, that would make sense. So. I'll play around with that. When you say make space, before you had to make space, you had to do S to do colon colon. Mm hmm. Right? Could you do using the space here? Circle colon colon, I believe so. But that wouldn't work for the other function. It's not very that way. I don't know. Experiments to run. This? That's, that's been in, in the last few class examples. So that's just okay. scoping. Oh, is it telling everything that everything's public? Uh, I think it's saying that those variables, variables. So does it terminate and methods. Yeah. Oh, okay. Does it what? Where, where would that terminate then, the public? I think it's for public. the whole class. Okay. So it is for the whole class? I think so, unless you say private. <laughs> and then that would overwrite. Okay. Well, let's Not try this. Public. I'm just in the back of the area. Alright, so now everything after that is private. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so um, we're out of time. But I still wanted to show you operator overloading, so maybe we'll do that next week. Um, so open open classroom tomorrow. Um, really good time if you have lingering issues with the lab or the programming assignment. Well, technically, <laughs> but you know how it goes. Um, yeah, so I'll see you tomorrow if you come in for that. And then Monday, PA5 presentations, okay? So I'll have an HDMI, I'll have a VGA, and one person from the group should hopefully have something that we can plug in and you can show us your code. We'll bring the router in here and we can play with that. Yeah. How are you presenting SLP?
So it's the thing Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the digital lounge. Yeah, except there's no posters, right? Because he turned in a report instead. So bring whatever you want to do your presentation. Print a poster if you like, or if you have show and tell, bring that and so on. Okay.